All right. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Sean Young. I am the CEO uh, and co-founder of Classcraft. And uh, this is um, webinar one of our Chat with the Experts series that we're doing throughout all of August. Our goal is to um, convene um, and um, talk about education research with education researchers. Um, talk about the work they're doing, the trends they're seeing, get their perspective. They're, um, we're very fortunate to have uh, these uh, guests because they're people who are thinking about education uh, very deeply and who have agreed to, you know, come have this chat so that we can, you know, hopefully learn from them, get some ideas. Um, it's, it's very hard to have access to research, I find, for a lot of educators. Having been an educator myself, you really have to go out of your way to get it. So hopefully this is a way that will make it uh, interesting and digestible. So our first guest uh, on this series is Dr. Kent McIntosh. So hi, Kent, and welcome for, thank you for being here and welcome. Happy to be here. I'm excited about the chance. I didn't know that I was kicking it all off. So this sounds fantastic. I better live up to the expectations. Well, uh, <laughs> that won't be very hard. Uh, we're. Uh, extremely uh, fortunate to, to have you here. So I um, am just going to uh, introduce you a little bit with, uh, you know, your bio and, and et cetera. So um, Kent McIntosh is a PhD. He is the Philip H. Knight Chair of Special Education at the University of Oregon. He is the co-director of the Center on Positive Behavior Intervention and Supports, PBIS, for those of you who know that acronym. Um, his current research focuses on increasing racial equity in school discipline and implementation and sustainability of systems for social, emotional, and behavior supports in schools. So obviously, um, a topic that we care about here wholeheartedly and for which we're going to be um, conversing uh, here over this next little while. So again, thanks for being here. And uh, this is meant to be an informal conversation. So, you know, in that vein, you know, I think it would be cool to, um, you know, have a bit of a human side of things to kick this off. So you know, here's my like non-relevant question just to, you know, break the ice. So what's your hobby, Kent? Uh, I've got a couple of hobbies and they kind of inter, uh, interact a little bit. I've got a 12 year old and a 10 year old at home. And so any time spent with them uh, is probably the best time that I get to spend. Uh, and it's a bonus if it gets to be uh, somewhere outdoors, somewhere active. Uh, so we like to get out camping, like to get out onto the water, uh, like to get out on hikes. So that's, that's number one. And then the other thing, I don't know if this is a hobby or a lifestyle or what is daily exercise for me. I get up before everybody else wakes up in the morning and uh, get my exercise done. I've crossed it off the list. And then uh, it's not something that I'm too tired to come back for. And I feel like it's, you know, physical health, it's mental wellness, it's prepping me for the day. So it's just that part of that routine that gets everything off going well. So important. Good for you. That's real discipline every day. Yeah, every day. Wow. Wow. I do uh, three times a week. And I'm impressed with every day. <laughs> you know, I know those people who have those like running streaks of like 400 days or something like that. And uh, my body would not be able to handle that much. But uh, mm. yeah, I, I, I try to stick to it as best I can. And when I don't, uh, uh, you know, I feel you it. feel it. Yeah, totally. Well, that's awesome. Super inspiring. Um so tell us a bit about your research. How did you get started? You know, you've been at this for a while now. Um, what what interested you uh, to get into this field? You know, when I uh, went through my university uh, degree, I got uh, I uh, majored in education and uh, went through the student teaching. And when I was doing my final student teaching, I was recognizing that. Uh, I was a, not a very good general education teacher because I was attending to all the few students in the class who were just not engaged, who were asleep, who, um, who I really wanted to reach and teach. So I figured out, you know, fairly quickly that uh, I wanted to work with that group more than anything else. Um, and I found my way into, you know, this kind of connects to that hobby I was talking about, uh, this uh, area called wilderness therapy. 
So mm. the idea, I worked with a, a, a alternative sentencing program where we would, uh, students uh, or youth uh, adolescents would go before a judge and the judge would say, you know, do you want to, you can either go to the detention facility or you can go out camping for a month and, and learn some skills and learn something about yourself. And so they would uh, come out and we would sort of take them out of that environment for a month. They would, you know, uh, learn new skills. They'd learn about themselves. They'd uh, reach, uh, you know, get to experience a little adversity and challenge and, and dig deep and then learn how to work with each other, learn how to resolve conflicts and so on. And, and I found it really like, for me, it was very worthwhile, but we would also do these reconciliation sessions where we would bring the youth back with their families and kind of reintegrate them mm. into the environment. And, and for me, it, it became really clear, you know, we were taking uh, these students out of their environment or these kids out of their environment giving them all these skills, but maybe the skills weren't necessarily working for the same environment they were going back to. Mm. For me, I was really interested in, well, how do we change the environment? How do we make the environment more nurturing? How do we make it, uh, you know, much easier for youth and adolescents to do the pro-social thing as opposed to the anti-social thing? Mm. That mm. threw me into this area of saying, okay, well, what do we, you know, if I'm, if I'm not going to be working specifically in general education classroom, uh, but I want to work on systems change. You know, I, um, that's, I sort of came into both these two areas of social emotional learning and also positive behavior support and finding ways to connect both of those together and really make schools a place where kids want to be, where they're successful, uh, where it's easier to do the things that we know will be helpful for them in life. And um, it's a little bit more challenging to, to, to do the stuff that the adults don't want them to do. Mm, totally. I mean, it's such important, you know, the, I find like for me, um, my, my mission as an educator is, is so closely resonates to what you're talking about. Like for me, it was about making school meaningful, respecting their time, you know, like, they have to be here, but it doesn't have to feel that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, can we can we make this relevant uh, for them? And um, and so like, and that's what got me on the journey for Classcraft. You know, the of saying, well, okay, I did that with curriculum, made you know project based learning, et cetera. And then what's the next step? Well, the next step is actually making it feel like a community, making it feel like you know they're supported and loved and by by each other too. You know, not just the staff, but creating those conditions amongst themselves. Yeah. Um, so tell us a bit about, you know, the, the center, you know, the, you're doing the research, we'll get to the research, but, you know, you're doing really important work uh, at the center on PBIS. You know, I think anybody who's done any Google search about PBIS sooner or later lands there. So, you know, what's going on with that center? Yeah, so the center is we're going on our 24th year of existence, which is yeah, it's a amazing. I'm, I don't know I, I don't know what anniversary 24 is uh, for gifts, but uh, uh, maybe the gift is uh, to go online and grab some resources, and that would make it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, it's the resources anniversary. Sounds good. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> that sounds great. So uh, we're federally funded initially by the Office of Special Education Programs and the Department of Ed, and uh, also more recently, the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education. So gen ed and special ed uh, linking up together. Uh, and we were really put together a very, um, uh, the sort of predecessor center to this was the idea of how do we support uh, students, particularly students with emotional and behavior disorders, EB, mm. um, and how do we help them be successful in schools? And doing that in the one student by one student approach uh, really was, um, it was effective, but not very efficient and really challenged, you know, easy to do when you, there are a few students in your school or a student in a classroom, but what does it look like when you have six students in your classroom on individual mm -hmm. support mm -hmm. and, uh, and so the idea was like, could we make the school itself a more 
uh, positive host environment where when students kind of don't know what they're supposed to be doing or sort of wondering, they kind of look around and say, oh, everybody else is actually doing this. And it's, you know, mutually reinforcing for us to get along well together. So, so you do this opportunity where you create uh, something where everybody can be successful and then there is this sort of you know group motivation or what for us all to work together mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how that fits so everything uh, from the center is all freely available because it's federally funded you can go to the website pbis.org uh, and grab information there um, i've been co-director of the center for the last four years so this last iteration of it and then um, was um, and have facilitated the center's equity work group for it's going on nine uh, nine years now uh, to mm. be a really specific focus on racial equity in school discipline and then also uh, equity disability status equity in school discipline so that's been one of the things that i feel like um has been uh, a really nice advance over the last uh, 10 years or so in, in this mm -hmm. world. Yeah, and so important. I mean, you know, part of what you're, you're saying uh, is, you know, the, yes, special education is super important, but the context in which special education is happening is super important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the center is supporting, you know, whole school initiatives so that we can elevate all students. And in doing that, elevate the ones that need it the most. And, you know, when, when I, when I think about that and I think about equity, um, you know, we know the research is super clear, right? There's so much um, disproportionality in behavior intervention for, you know, non-white students or students that don't, that are, you know, on behavior plans. And, um, you know, and I think that, you know, being able to contextualize that work within the broader, like whole school work that's happening is super relevant and important. And I think that's a bit of the, what the research you're doing now is, right? Like yeah. outside of the center, you know, back, you know, switch, put the other hat on the, the researcher, you know, <laughs> a University of Oregon hat, like that's the research you're working on these days, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things that the, that the equity work group was doing was saying out of uh, the, the very little hard uh, research that was out there, uh, out of our experiences, you know, there's so many good ideas, but what are the things that really, really make a difference? And so this mm. idea of increasing the cultural responsiveness of our behavior support systems and schools is, that's like really broad, like that basically encompasses like every aspect of education and so every element that's daunting of, isn't it <laughs> yeah, and we, we can think about like there are so many different things that you could do or try and i kind of wanted to make sure that what we were recommending that we had some good like evidence behind it that it wasn't yeah like, you know here's some things that you can do and we think they might be useful so our work in the last few years has been taking some of those strategies that we've been recommending you can find online on the um, pbs.org site and saying like let's do a real test of this and see uh, and so it's we walk people through looking at their discipline data we have people look at patterns and i think one of the things that's interesting about when people hear about like discipline data and disproportionality most of the time you know a school team or a district team or something they see it they see it and they say oh, we're disproportionate. Oh, you know, either A, uh, that means we're bad people and so we should feel ashamed. Mm -hmm. Or B, uh, we should, you know, start making excuses. Uh, or C, we should just be attacking the whole idea that everybody can mm -hmm. be successful in schools and, and calling out particularly, you know, when you look at the data, it's particularly Black or African-American students. So, and boys. Uh, and boys, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. I was just looking at the most recent data when you look at uh, out-of-school suspensions. This is national. Yeah. One in five students is suspended out of school at least once during the school year. So, um, sorry, one in 20, 5%. Um, I was going to say one in five. So one in five would be <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, I mean, one in 20 is still, oh, my God, but... <laughs> One in 20, but the one in five is actually black students with disabilities. 
Mm -hmm. so 5% mm -hmm. overall. It is 12% if you're black. It is about eight or 9% if you have a disability, 19% if you're black with a disability, and uh, but only 7% if you're male, which I thought was really surprising. So mm, that uh, is surprising. Black, having a disability are all greater risks. Uh, of course. Being uh, uh, male. And I, I think a lot of, that was a little surprising to me to be able to see that. But yeah. when you start thinking about this intersectionality, black boys with disabilities, you know, without a doubt. But, you know, so one of the things that, that a lot of people do is they see that and they go, oh my gosh. And then they sort of stop there. Yeah. What we try to do is we say, well, instead of stopping there, let's let, we can sit with that discomfort for a little bit, but let's actually drill down farther, further and further into the data and see. And what we've been doing is working with teams on this idea of um, identifying these things called vulnerable decision points or hmm. And these vulnerable decision points are really specific situations where I, as a teacher, am more likely to respond to a student uh, based on my implicit biases than I am based on the sort of facts at hand or the, the real situation. And so- Okay, wait, wait, wait. Just for people listening, yeah. VPDs, do you want to just re-explain that again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. VPD is a vulnerable decision point. And- Okay. Uh, and so basically, these are just situations where uh, our biases are more in control of our behavior than mm. our just minds are. Mm. That's such a deep, powerful concept. Yeah. And so what we can see, and we've, we've done this, is in general, um, in, we see more disproportionality, more bias coming through referrals in the classroom than anywhere else. Huh. And we see it for more for um, subjective behavior categories like defiance mm. or disruption mm. than mm. anything else. And so you start thinking about this and it's really easy if you've been an educator to say, mm -hmm. you know, if I'm just walking down the hallway and I see a student and they're doing something that I don't want them to do. I'm not really under this like wild time crunch unless I'm trying to, you know, get to the restroom sure. in between classes. But yeah, exactly. I only have three minutes to go pee. So I, have... <laughs> that would be one of, the, one of the situations, but in general, it's sort of like, okay, a student does this thing. I've got 39 other students in my classroom. I'm trying to get through this lesson because, because mm -hmm. I know that to be a good teacher means I get to the last page, you know, of the lesson, you know, by the bell. Yeah, I do what I planned. Yeah. Right. And so, so any of that ups it so that I'm less thinking about, Oh, what does this student need? What's, what's going on behind this? It's more like that's defiance. You're out of here. Whereas a mm -hmm. student might be kind of reacting to the curriculum and might be saying like, I don't, you know, I don't get the relevance of this or uh, uh, this is hard for me. And the way that I'm showing that is, you know, by, by goofing by off, acting out. Yep. Exactly. Yep. So what we do is we find these vulnerable decision points and we say that that stops it from a, like, am I a bad person or am I a good person? Mm -hmm. We just put our good teacher hat on and we say, Oh, wow. We're seeing more of these, you know, in the first 30 minutes of the school day. So what happens for us in our school in the first 30 minutes of the school day? And how can we make that a little bit more welcoming? So that's, mm. that's one. And not every, the time of day, uh, we definitely see classroom. We see that defiance. Those are really common. The time of day will depend on the, the individual school and the context mm -hmm. and their schedule. Um, but we see a little bit more like um, middle schools right at that beginning of the day is where we see more disproportionality. So what's going on? You know, our students are often based on that adolescent brain are more wired to be sleep, you know, sleep in. Yeah. Late. So, yeah. you know, up in the morning, a little bit more um, drowsy. We might be a little bit of the same, you know, related to it. And we I know for me as a teacher, it wasn't until 10 a.m. that I was like, you know, at my full game and the students would comment on it at first. <laughs> like you're so different at first period and at third period. So, so that insight that you have, Sean, about yep. your teaching is really good. And it's funny because it's insight you had, but it's also insight your students have about you too. You know? Yeah, we had a good enough relationship that they would, you know, give me that kind of feedback. Uh, but yeah. 
yeah 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 but 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 you're right i mean and it's even worse for them right you know oh. when schools that you know start at 8 a.m for teenagers it's just so brutal um i'm not surprised that that would be an impact you know an, an impacting context yeah yeah and just in that adolescent you know for kids it's it's less of a big deal but we start we can start thinking about like you know do we have such a focus on academic press that <clears throat> mm -hmm. We're just jumping right in as opposed to doing some warm up activities, some, you know, fluency building activities, or maybe we've got a, a morning meeting or, you know, classroom meeting to start the day off with a, with a little bit more, relationship mm -hmm, building, mm -hmm. you know, something like that. But all of that is all in contrast to the just you're a bad person and you know, totally. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's, that has been, and I think that's really powerful. I mean, I think, you know, I've, we, you know, Classcraft um, has a diversity, equity, inclusion board of advisors, and, you know, people from um, different school districts, you know, that are, you know, represent BIPOC people and helping us because, you know, we do behavior intervention and, you know, I'm a white, you know, cis male. Um, so, you know, it's it's uncomfortable to you know we have a responsibility to look at the data look at what classcraft is doing from a behavior standpoint like we can have such a big impact from that but at the same time i have definitely and clearly have biases in that regard oh, yeah. and so really helpful to have this board but um but it's very uncomfortable i think to start the conversations for a lot of educators because there's shame attached to that you know i think the you know when you were saying earlier on we see three reactions you know the first one is shame and i was listening to the other two i'm like those are all just shame in different forms <laughs> you know i'm like honestly like that's what's happening there and i think being able to take the data to you know depersonalize it that's important but then i think what you're you know if i could paraphrase what i'm hearing it, you know what you're saying is like those are moments where, you know, whether or not you are doing the work, you're aware of the bias or not, there are these moments where you as a teacher should be conscious that this is when this is going to happen more often. And you're vulnerable to be making those types of, you know, disproportionate decisions and, you know, negatively impacting minority students. And, and I think that if we putting it that lens on says, well, you know, teaching is a hard job, we're asking you to you know, be extra equitable here. And, you know, that's not always easy in every single context. Um, but here are, you know, three, four, five, six different moments, different times, different strategies to help you, you know, do your best work. Uh, and I think framing it that way, you know, can take the conversation away from the shame and more into solutions, right? Absolutely. And, and I think that it starts opening the door to, you know, what do we, you know, you're talking about, like, well, what is it like, you know, the vast majority of our teaching force is white. If yeah. You know. And so, you know, when we are deliberately making a positive school culture, we're deciding what is positive and what is negative. Right, right. If we're doing that based on a lot of assumptions of like, oh, this is what it was like when I was at school, or this is how I think students are supposed to be, or this is this is uh, what my- How a society is. should run, right? Yeah. Totally, totally. And so being able to check that, review that, use our students and their families as resources to co-create those systems, or mm -hmm. at the very least to look and we say, hey, this is what we think, these, these are our core values, our school-wide expectations that we have. What do you think of those? Do those resonate with you? Would you, you know, would you change some of those? What does it look like for, uh, what do these look like for you at home? You know, what do mm. these look like um, when, we, when we talk to students? What, is that, what does it look like when you're out with your friends? And being able to take that, you can, you can take it in a few different ways, but sometimes it's just to check ourselves and say, when I see behavior that I look at and I say, that's, that's problem behavior, it, yeah, I got to ask myself, is it, or is it just different than what I'm used to? And mm -hmm. maybe it's just a variation on acceptable and just fine that I haven't been exposed to, you know, totally. so just level of noise, level of 
you know, we're sort of used to this idea, you know, you and I are having a nice back and forth. If I was doing a webinar, it would just be, you know, me talking for, yeah. you know, five minutes. And so I'm not, I might not be used to somebody interjecting part of the way through and, and, um, and I might mistake engagement in the lesson for know, like rudeness and cutting you off. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that is, mm -hmm. that is often the way, you know, um, not all, but many of the non-dominant cultures uh, in, think about interaction uh, in the classroom and that interaction, mm -hmm. this idea of uh, overlap so that we would have a, that, that my, my lessons would be a conversation with a little bit of audience feedback um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. would be you know, viewed as that, like, that's the right thing to do, because that's what we do in our family. That's what we do in church. That's what we do, you know, wherever it is, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. place of worship or not place of worship. Uh, they're just different linguistic styles. And it just so happens that, you know, the, the family that I'm raising right now, we're all really loud, and we all watch out about interrupting each other. Uh, but the one I was raised in was pretty quiet. And, you know, the idea of raising, raising your voice or, you know, showing big emotions or interrupting somebody would be like, that would be like a no go. So yeah, you know, I gotta yeah. watch out for that for me. Hmm. Well, it's interesting. I was having a conversation about um, diversity, equity, inclusion with a, with a leader uh, who has, it was a uh, Pakistani background and, you know, he was saying one of the big things that he sees from that cultural perspective is just the um, the big uh, divergence in perspectives around individualism versus, you know, communal, you know, the importance of community or, you know, being part of the, the mass. And, you know, and he was saying for, you know, students from that perspective, you know, like, they won't spontaneously call out because they're, you know, like to have speaking up spontaneously in a classroom is really not, you know, culturally normal for them. And, you know, and from our Western perspective, we could see that as, you know, disengagement or, you know, non-participation, you know, however you want to call it. Right. And, and uh, you know, and, and that's like such a, like, to me, that was an interesting example because it's like, yeah, like Classcraft's all about engagement and, you know, m motivating specific individual learners and, you know, like all of this focus on personalized learning, all that's, you know, and that's, you know, such a trend right now in, in education and all of that's, you know, can be super uncomfortable for, you know, specific types of students. And, you know, and we're not even talking about, you know, how you respond to your emotions or anything like that. Just like, what are norms for how you engage with the classroom? So it's really fascinating because there's so much, so many dimensions to this. Um, I think one of them is, is you know, how we give praise. And, and when we were preparing for this, we were talking about, you know, a clear example of how you can get students input on your own teaching practice. And you, you have, um, you're currently researching and developing uh, what you call the praise preference survey. Um, you know, which to me seemed like, oh, that's such a like easy thing any teacher could do, you know? So like, can you just tell us a bit about that and what impact you're seeing it have? You bet. Yeah, it is, it kind of connects. I think a lot of uh, teachers, educators are familiar with like doing a survey with students, like a, uh, if somebody is, you know, has a behavior contract or, or a card and they, um, you build a, what's called like a reinforcer preference survey. What would you be willing to work for if you, you know, did really well and we checked in mm -hmm. and making progress or something like that? Um, this is all before that. So this is how would you like me, how would you as students like me to signal that uh, you just did something really well? How can, how can I celebrate uh, a, a little bit of behavior success that, that you just had. And our common way would be sort of this uh, generic, like, good job that you say to the whole class. So it's sort of this right. not very specific uh, attend, attending to it. Maybe they don't even know what they got it for. You know, it's sort of this sort of vague thing. So, you know, we know that uh, one of the most powerful um, 
ways to motivate is through this specific positive feedback about behavior. And whether you want to call it positive descriptive feedback or whether you want to call it behavior specific praise might depend on, you know, what orientation you have or what camp you're in. But the idea of being able to celebrate and signal to a student when they've done something uh, right or when they've done something that the adults want them to do or that the class has decided is a positive thing. But everybody handles that a little bit differently. So, you know, I think of some students would absolutely love it if the teacher stops class and says, hey, everybody pay attention to Sean. He just turned in his homework without me even asking for it, right? Yeah. So you might really love that. Or you might think, oh my God, I am never going to turn in my homework again because that was embarrassing. That's so humiliating. Awesome. Yeah. 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 I don't want to look like the teacher's pet or I don't want to look like, I don't want to look like I'm trying to be better. You know, your description, I don't want to look like I'm up for individual achievement and putting everybody else down. Mm -hmm. So this idea of the praise preference survey is that, uh, and it's pretty straightforward, you know, um, educators, so this is generally classroom teachers would do this write down a list of all of the ways that they would be willing to uh, acknowledge a student for doing well. And so that obviously could be, uh, you know, public praise. It could be quiet praise. You know, I might come up to you and say, Sean, I just saw that you uh, just put your homework in. Nice work, you know, kind of on the side. It could be like a, a signal that you and I know together, you know, and we, we do that and it's like, oh yeah, that's, that's the thing. Uh, it might be using a school, if there's a school-wide uh, acknowledgement system, like a ticket, or you might have a class, uh, you know, uh, marbles in a jar to get a shared social reward or something like that. Um, and so the idea is you put, the, put down this list, you uh, write up a survey, and you could either do this paper or you could do it, you know, electronically. Uh, and have uh, students need to put their names on it. And that's important because of the way you, you know, get it back. You could do it anonymously if you wanted to, but it's not quite as powerful. And then students will essentially, you know, circle the things they like and cross out the things they don't like. And then you collect all of that and you say, there's two ways to, to sort of make changes based on that. One of them is if I'm having a hard time connecting with you, Sean, and I'm really going to pay attention to your individual responses and say, yep, no quiet praise for Sean. It's always got to be public praise or, mm -hmm. or you know, vice versa. Um, but then all and, and that's going to be really important, especially if your data shows like, wow, we are really over referring Black students to the office. So mm -hmm. I really want to pay mm -hmm. attention to the uh, praise preferences of the Black students in my classroom so that I can continue to build those positive student teacher. Yeah. Yeah. And then the second thing is actually look at it systems wide. And you see, you kind of look and you say, oh, wow, nobody likes the marbles in the jar thing. Nobody wants to get a marble in the jar. So it makes you go, oh, okay, maybe I want to, maybe I need to tweak that. Maybe I need to get. Yeah. Maybe I need to get a few students together and have them tell me how I could improve that um, or, or jettison it because, you know, uh, it's always good to get rid of stuff that's not working as opposed to make changes um, mm -hmm. if it, it, unless, unless you've got a really good, you know, reason for it. We're always really good at giving educators more things to do, but we're not always as great. Yeah. Like, yeah, you can let this part go. Um, and so you take all of that information back and it's pretty, it's pretty helpful in that way. And you can even keep, you know, you keep it to yourself and be able to recognize and just sort of go through it and say like, oh yeah, he liked this, mm -hmm. or she liked that. And so, you know, what I love so much about this is like, uh, it's so simple to do, right? Like yeah, you can yeah. literally open a Google doc right now, any teacher, write down, you know, things you're willing to do. That's an important part here, right? Like don't put things you don't want to do on that praise list, yep. you know? So it's pretty easy to come up with the list of, you know, less than 10 things that you're willing to do for praise. And that's it. You can go and, you know, get the information, from, you know, the, the first day of school. And, you know, and I, th and I think it's so powerful to have that data because, you know, in an era where we're, talking about, you know, again, personalized learning, specific social emotional needs of every single child. Um, like, of course, 
and it all starts with praise, right? So of course we should be as specific as we can about, you know, being as effective as possible for every single child in this regard. And it's such easy data to get. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, when you uh, when you first told me about this, I was like, man, that's so simple. Um, and and in fact, you know, the I think that's kind of what's powerful about it is just like we often talk about you know getting data to inform our decisions as you know as educators and you know response to intervention and tiered approaches and all of these really important you know tiered systems that you know I believe in and I know you believe in, but you know, there's so much value to being able to do it at such a micro scale as well and empowering teachers to just do that. And in such a simple way, you don't need anybody's permission to do that. You, know, you just go do it, get the information and, you know, draw your own conclusions. If you want to get super micro about, you know, I'll memorize every preference for every child or, or, you know what, these are the top three. And I'll probably, if I focus on these three, probably, you know, do all right. You know, it doesn't have to be complicated. And, and that's what I love about this. Yeah. And you can always, you know, anytime I, I always think about this, especially as people are coming back to school, what is one difference that you're going to make that's going to have an effect? And then you test it out. And then the idea mm -hmm. is like, oh, wow. I did this, I'm gonna share it at the next faculty meeting to say, hey, you know, I tried this out and I'd recommend that other people give it a try. And then it's like, oh, okay, how do we build that into our systems? And how do we like, oh, that becomes, you know, part of the school-wide survey at the end of the first week or, you know, whatever it is, just like, let's keep systematizing. Let's keep making it easier and easier as we go. Mm -hmm. And then people can always choose to figure out how they want to, uh, how they want to make it work, but to be able to kind of uh, work together on something like that and say, wow, that was really cool. Um, you know, it, it, especially in the equity work uh, that we do, um, there's this, there's this sort of thought about like, well, we need to wait until we have changed hearts and minds and mm. then we will be committed to this. Uh, but there is this other view that's a little bit more research supported that says, if you give somebody a thing that's gonna work you know, pretty well and it's small, it's doable, then they come back and say, all right, what's, what's the next thing? Yeah. You have to be a yeah. little bit careful. You know, it can't be totally race neutral. If your data say that you are over referring a certain group of students, then you should be using your data to support better that group of students and then be able mm -hmm. to come back mm -hmm. and do it. Uh, but yeah, we have found really good results by providing um, these quick, easy strategies. And then that helps people go, huh, yeah, I wonder how I set up my classroom. I wonder who, who are the families that I am more likely to reach out to with positive news or reach out mm -hmm. to with mm -hmm. uh, bad news or, oh my gosh, what about my, you know, what about praise preferences for, you know, the families that I work with and how do mm -hmm. I up those ratios mm -hmm. and some of that deeper stuff about really going in, you know, like you were saying, Sean, about like, well, how do we think about like how our Western education system is built for this individual achievement. And how do I go in and really change it up so it's okay to have that focus and mm -hmm. it's okay to have this collective focus? And uh, that's a pretty big lift for somebody right at the beginning of the year. Oh yeah, they give it a go and then they see and it's like, oh, we can, we can, we can do this. I want. Mm. Well, and it's interesting because like the so much of it comes from giving voice to those students and those communities. Like one of the things, so, you know, for, for people new to Classcraft here, Classcraft is a system where, you know, teach schools and teachers set specific behaviors they want to see, and then they reinforce them. And, you know, there's a whole motivation engine behind that, you know, borrowing off of self-determination theory and games. You can look it up. But one of the things that we, often recommend is, you know, yes, put in, you know, your school-wide expectations, but then sit with the students and ask them what they think are good behaviors, you know, like going, you know, once you've identified praise preference, praise preference for what, right? Like what are the things? And very often we hear from, from teachers saying, you know, like 
my eyes were open. Like what I want to reinforce them for are not the same things that they see as valuable, right? Like I want to reinforce you for raising your hand before talking. Cause that's like, I want to control my classroom. Like that helps me the teacher, but the kids want to be like reinforced for like coming up with good jokes or like, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Totally. And, 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 you know, jokes is, is, you know, a bit of a silly example, but quite often kids will identify behaviors that are super relevant for the teacher and relevant for them. And, you know, the impact of saying, okay, well, you know what, you guys pick these four behaviors. Those are the ones I'll make sure that I look out for, Mm -hmm. you know, and then again, we can, you know, multiply the effect of like praise reference behavior, you know, what's relevant behavior and, and then look at the data to see, you know, we, we don't, Costcraft doesn't have referral data, but a lot of the data we have is praise data. So mm-hmm. which which kids are getting reinforced positively for which behaviors? And you know, you can see the same uh <laughs> the same discrepancies there as well. Right. And and it's interesting because it's before they're referred, right? It's well before. And so I think that there's value as well to like looking at if you can, if you have a digital system to capture praise, mm-hmm. um, that data is a, a really leading indicator towards, you know, lack of praise is often correlated with referrals and suspensions. Um, and there's biases there too. Like, oh, I haven't given Ken any praise this week. And you know what? Like, I don't have any criticism for him. So like what gives? And often that will, you know, also being confronted with any sort of data about your own interventions is, you know, if you're, if we can help teachers be ready to <laughs> accept it. Uh, you know, I think that's a challenge, but, you know, if you are ready to accept it, the data is really eye opening quite often. Oh, yeah. um, so when you're I love the, I love that you're doing that. I, I like that you're able to, to be able to give that to educators and, and have them be able to look it up and, and check mm-hmm. it out. Cause yeah, our data you know, all the observational data say that, uh, you know, I, I'm focusing, you know, more of the work that I do is in elementary schools. So that's why we really have uh, this focus on anti-Black bias, because that is the larger group. And as you go into uh, middle school and high school, we also see Latina and Indigenous students as well getting more exposed to discipline. But what you see the patterns, you know, as you were talking about, we were talking about disproportionality in office referrals. We see that same disproportionality in use of praise and whether Mm -hmm. that's exactly, uh, exactly informal or whether that's our formal, you know, points or or whatever. And um, we we also have data from two research teams showing the the better the implementation of those acknowledgement or uh, reward systems the better equity, racial equity in school discipline. Ah. I think you're, you know. So, so what's a good implementation? What does that look like? You know, um, the things that I really like to do, and we use this with some of our fidelity of implementation tools, is we walk around the school and we ask students, hey, um, and, and we pay attention to student demographics. Say, hey, hey, how's it going? Have you, um, let me, let me ask you a question. Have you been a- acknowledged by uh, a teacher or an adult in the building for doing things the right way in the last uh, month or so? And if they say no, then it's like, okay. If they say yes, usually I ask what for. And if they don't mm. know what for, then it's this really good cue of like, mm, oh, they got totally. general praise, right? They yeah. Think- specific they didn't they didn't yeah. really get that lesson drilled in but then I also ask like okay well was it in a way that you like was it in a way that was meaningful for you that's what we ask secondary students or was it just a way that you liked if we're asking mm-hmm. Adam, mm-hmm. For younger students and so that's really useful and then you can also look at that if you're paying attention to demographics and start looking at uh, any uh, racial differences or group differences, disability status, gender identity differences that you can see in there. Mm-hmm. So that's really uh, useful for us in doing it and being able to, you know, being able to count that is great, but it's really expensive, you know, so to have a coach to go in and do that mm-hmm. is a challenge. 
we have a we have a free app that you can use called Be Positive, mm -hmm. and you can um, track your own use of acknowledgement, and you can even set up for different groups and so on. But if you got a system where that's built in, you know, mm -hmm. you have, then you know that's already occurring for you. That does not require a coach to watch everything, but it might require a coach to have those conversations or totally, somebody totally. to be in and say, Hey, let's, let's talk about, you know, the patterns in your instruction and, and so on. And um, taking time to like, look at it. I mean, you've developed uh, a self-assessment survey for schools as well. Um, you know, class, you've been kind enough to allow Classcraft to, to redistribute it. Um, you can, there's an online version at pbisassessment.classcraft.com. You can also access it at pbis.org but um you know taking the time once a year twice a year to just survey the staff and you know yeah. see what those like now is kind of a good time to do that right as the year as you start the year how is our behavior system being implemented um it's a good time to to think about you know taking a, a bit of a cold hard look at it at the beginning of the year and you know trying to make progress um you know, it's good to have a benchmark, at least, I think, uh, as you start out the year of like, here's where we're at, we're trying to get there, we'll resurvey at the end of the year and see, you know, how we're doing. But, um, but I think that it like, we quite often will um, use qualitative measures for progress in education. And there are a lot of great quantitative tools. So uh, I think that's one example the the SAS, uh, you, but you have several other tools as well to, to help schools do that, don't you? Yeah, and they're all freely available and you can find them on pbisapps.org. Uh, but, you know, when we, um, we used to say like, take one, it sort of doesn't matter which one you take, find the one that's useful for you. And then, uh, you know, take it once a year in this. Refer back to it, exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what we've noticed, and this is, I mean, I'm saying it's like it's recent, but it's over the past 10 years, um, many times when a team sits down at the beginning of the school year, they are not the same team that did it last spring. And that is especially true the last couple of years. Oh, it's, it's yeah. brutal, isn't it? Over or more. And so to be able to do that check-in in the fall and say, where really are we? Did mm -hmm. we do you know, do we have all of the signage up to cue students? Do we, did we actually do our teaching according to the teaching schedule we had? You know, do we have the systems up in place? You can do that, you know, in September, October, and then do it again in the spring. And you've got these sort of, like you're saying, these bookends of saying, how are mm -hmm. we doing? And that's a great place to set up in terms of action planning. What are our next steps? What we're going to do for that? So yeah, you can grab those. That's things. interesting. I mean, I think, it, you know, especially I wasn't thinking about the the turnover angle, but that's so important to have because the knowledge just leaves with the people, right? Um, so to be able to have that documented somewhere that's accessible is so important. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, you were talking about the last decade and, you know, uh, as, as we're, we're coming up here on, on the hour, I was, you know, what are you, you've been looking at, you know, this behavior space for 20 years, maybe more, <laughs> I won't presume on your age, um, but, um, you know, 20 odd years, like, what are the big changes you're seeing? I mean, obviously the pandemic happened, uh, like, how has that impacted this space? You know, one trend seems to be, you know, a focus on, on DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, which you, you know, we've talked about. But are there other, other trends that you're seeing that, you know, we should be aware of? Yeah, you know, the, the, we had already talked a little bit before about doing this co-creation of systems with students instead of, you, mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. you with instead of two, which I think is uh, really, really important. Um, I think that when we when we, there was just a survey, uh, YouGov just did a survey of educators looking at what, what are the biggest challenges related to um, actually, you know, learning loss or, or academic, you know, acceleration. And the number one, you know, seven out of 10 teachers said it was behavior support for students. Uh, yes, I think that what we've what we've done is, um, you know, as a field, we have often forgotten that some of 
the really basic things that we know work, we've, we've sort of, you know, slipped on those. And so just the idea of setting up, you know, uh, a classroom schedule where it's really clear, you come in, you have a routine that you enter, it has this sort of like, you get to mm -hmm. leave your outside world, you get to still bring your authentic self, but we, you know, change the, change the setting, come in, uh, have a little bit of grounding, know what's going to happen, you know, throughout. Um, we know that's really important in terms of uh, thinking about trauma, you know, and the best mm. thing we think about, you know, what, what we've learned about brain science and so on is best thing we can do is have classrooms and schools that are safe, that are predictable, and that are positive. And so, you know, my, my worry about that is sometimes we say, okay, that means we got to stop everything that we're doing and implement this trauma program that may not have mm -hmm. any kind of evidence behind it. But instead, if we were to say, well, wait a minute, we actually know how to make our classroom safe, positive, and predictable. You know, we're really clear about it. When we see unwanted behavior, the first question I have is, have I actually taught that? Or was mm -hmm. I assuming that students know what that is? Mm. Uh, how do I teach and reteach in a way that we, we think about social, emotional, um, and behavior support as primarily instructive, right? It's instruction. It's not the quick fix. It's we're, we're doing that teaching and reteaching. Day in, day out. Mm -hmm. jobs as, as educators. And so I think we've forgotten that. And a lot of times people will go to a packaged curriculum or they go to, um, you know, really expensive uh, professional learning programs for, uh, for educators, um, you know, and I think you can get a lot of value with some of that, but I think there are a lot of the basics, a lot of the mm -hmm. things that we know work. It's, a, um, there's so much of it as saying like, it's okay to get rid of that. It is okay to, um, uh, not, uh, you know, to put off uh, a new, uh, textbook adoption if, you've got this focus on what the data say, behavior support for students. So let's continue with that. Um, but let's really look and let's see like, you know, number one, think about like all of the initiatives that we've got in schools related to social emotional behavioral support and then say, which ones do we know whether we're even doing it? Which ones do we have evidence that it's working? And I really think kind of trim it down to safe classroom environment, students have the social and emotional skills and competencies to be able to leave school and be you know, productive members of society on their own terms. Mm -hmm. uh, those things are really, really critical. And um, yeah, so I think it means, it means in my mind, giving up on every single good thing that we can do so that we can focus on doing the great things that we know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Five great things, not 20 good things. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Because yeah. we just won't, we won't be able to do it all. Everybody, there's so many, the stack of things. On mm -hmm. the, I, I don't know about you, but I'm a, I'm a stacker. And so like, I know like a bad sign of things is I've got the pile of stuff on my desk and then when I'm right, right. moving a pile onto another one, then I know that like whatever was underneath it is like, mm -hmm. gone, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I don't do as much stacking because I don't bring home like as much stuff from conferences and so on. A lot of it's digital, but it's what are the things that I'm really going to attend to? What are the things in my inbox that are just going to, you know, you know, die there unread and then never touch it again. Mm -hmm, um, I mm -hmm. think you have to recognize like it's okay to mark that email as read and just move on with it. If it's not tied into what our mm -hmm. core action plan, our personal action plan for the year, or if I'm an administrator, my school or my district's action plan, start cutting away some of the stuff that gets, uh, that um, takes attention away from those key parts. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, such an important lesson. I mean, especially in the context of teacher turnover, like why are teachers leaving the profession? Um, you know, I think there's, that's a super complicated question to answer, but definitely one of them is, you know, a feeling of 
never being able to get the job done, uh, you know, being uh, asked to do so many things that, you know, because I think teachers want to do those core community relationship building things with students and they need support. So, you know, I don't think every teacher knows how, um, but there's no teacher that, it's like, oh, I'm going to be a teacher so that I can, you know, never talk to the kids and lecture in front. Like, mm-hmm. you know, they'll default to that, but that's not why they got into that job in the first place. Um, yeah. You know, and I think that it's it's school leadership's responsibility and it's teachers' responsibility, you know, school leadership to give that room and teachers, you know, take those space and say, you know what, what I really care about is community in my classroom. I care about you know, making sure kids want to be here. And once that happens, like, you know, the, the learning follows. And, and I think we've very much uh, put the academics first. Um, and I think there's a course correction happening massively, you know, and it was happening before the pandemic. I think the pandemic has really um, accelerated that a lot of our the schools we're working with are saying you know we're seeing 300 percent increase in referrals last school year like versus pre-pandemic times like like oh my god <laughs> like before it was a problem now it's an emergency you know the dealing with with behavioral issues so you know I, it makes me sad because it means that there's a lot of people suffering kids suffering on the other hand it gives me hope because it means that we're going to we have no choice but to address what needs to be addressed here. And, and the correction is going to happen. Um, you know, unfortunately, people are hurting now, but, you know, it gives me hope for the long term anyways. Just yeah, eyes are being opened right now in this regard. Well, and I think, I think. people forget that, um, you know, everyone's focusing on the students didn't get the academic lessons. The students right, the like learning lessons. loss, learning but, loss. Yeah. Uh, how about learning loss in terms mm-hmm. of like how to relate to each other? How about mm-hmm. self-regulation as learning loss? Like all of those things are all learning loss and it's not just the academics. And I'm not going to say don't pay any attention to that. But no, no, of course. Attention for a little while might not be a bad thing, but you know, mm-hmm. balance it out. Yeah. Ken, it's been a real, real, real pleasure to have this conversation with you. Um, you know, I I I want to say a couple of things in closing. First of all, PBIS.org, really fantastic resources. Uh, University of Oregon has a really uh the strong uh research body around uh behavior intervention, et cetera. So uh, please check out that work. Um, also, if you're looking for tools and systems to do what we've been talking about, Classcraft is here to help. Um, you know, we can really help you um, do this in a way that is fun, positive, systematic, rigorous, et cetera. So um, please feel free to check us out. Uh, thank you so much for, for your time here, Kent, for, for uh, being so generous. You know, I think you're... Um, somebody who's been leading the charge for a long time, thinking about these things, these issues, and we are unfortunately not talking about it enough yet. So hopefully this conversation will get some people um, chatting. There is a message here uh, in the chat for you. So I'll read it out. I just want to thank Kent. He has also been an inspiration to me. Perfect way to start the school year from Kiki, as I prepare the family partnership webinar for Friday. So uh, I would say <laughs> there you totally go. Back to Kiki on okay. inspiration uh, to this work. She is really one of the leaders in in education and early childhood education. And it's just an honor to work with her and and uh, those around her. Fantastic. Well, thank you everybody for listening in and. Hopefully, Kent, uh, you'll be uh, getting outside uh, with what's left of August uh, every day, right? (laughs) Absolutely. That's what it's all about. And it's under 100, so uh, I call that a net win. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. And uh, good luck with Back to School, everybody listening in, and for yourself as well. Thanks again for having me. It's been great. Thank you.